So uh, I'd like to welcome everyone to the Data Architecture Virtual Chapter. I um, invited Glenn today to uh, give a presentation. I had the privilege of seeing this presentation at PASS, and I really enjoyed it. And um, so I emailed Glenn, and he said he'd give it. So really big thank you to Glenn for coming on the day out of his busy schedule and uh, give this really, I think, great presentation. Um, I want to shout out to Kenny Neal, who is our co-chapter leader. Thank you for your help. Let's see. Um, upcoming meetings. Uh, we're going to have several meetings coming up in the future. Ben, Tim, Brian, and Kimberly are all going to be having uh, agreed to have meetings on our chapter. So uh, thank you all. Sign up. I'll shoot out emails to uh, you know with the links to sign up for the future meetings. I want to thank Nutanix. Uh, they're our sponsor. They're really great. And um, if you have some time, click on the uh, link there, or I mean, you know, write down the link and uh, click on it and check out their website. They have some great uh, products and uh, stuff that uh, you know. And, and thank them for uh, helping our chapter out. Uh, Microsoft has a data amp. Um, event coming up and um, if you want to register to see it it's just microsoft.com data amp it's April the 19th at, and um, pass is going to be having 24 hours of pass on May the 3rd and the 4th and uh, check out uh, SQL pass and uh, register for it and that's all I have today I'm gonna go ahead and switch over to Glenn Okay, Glenn, uh, yeah, I can see your screen. All right, great. And thank you again. Oh, no problem. So thanks for the introduction. So this is going to be Hardware 301, diving deeper into database hardware. And my name is Glenn Berry. I'm a principal consultant at SQLSkills.com. I work with Paul Randall and Kimberly Tripp and John Kihias and Aaron Stilato. So anyways... What we're going to be talking about today, well, here's a little bit more about me. And the important thing here is my email. If there's anything that I don't answer during the session, send me an email, and I'll definitely get you an answer. And also, my Twitter handle is on there. And Twitter is a really good resource, by the way, for SQL Server people. You get to know people in the community, and you can use the SQL help hashtag to get quick answers to technical questions. So here's what we're going to talk about in this session. I'm going to talk about how important server hardware actually is and then talk about some of the SQL Server and Windows Server license considerations you need to think about when you're looking at a new server and then talk about how to evaluate and compare different processors because of the way SQL Server licensing works what you choose for your processor is really important not only for performance and scalability but also for your license costs which typically far outweigh your hardware costs and we'll get into some specific Intel server processor recommendations and talk a little bit about memory. And then any questions that come up during the session, we're going to answer them at the end. So go ahead and type those in as, as the session's going along. So if you've ever been a DBA for any amount of time, you know that anytime there's any kind of performance problem with your database or database server, people tend to notice really quickly. And it can affect your entire organization really quickly. And you can't just go in and reboot the database server and hope that that fixes the problem like you might do with a web server or application server. And you also probably know that DBA really means default blame acceptor. You know, I can't tell you how many times in my career I've heard, what's wrong with the database? Why is the database server so slow? And it could be that you just have really old, slow hardware or storage. And maybe you're not the one who picked that. And so as a DBA, I think it's really important that you have a little bit of knowledge about the hardware so you can understand whether old hardware might be part of your problem and whether you need to push for an upgrade. And then if an upgrade's in the cards, you know, imagine you're upgrading to SQL Server 2016 and you're going to get a new database server. You need to understand how to pick the right hardware so you don't get stuck with a really bad choice you have to live with for several years after that. So... This is your nightmare on 120 processor cores. You know, you don't want to see all your processor cores pegged at 100% if it's your database server. But SQL Server 
and hardware, nobody's ever come to me in my career and said, oh, the database server's too fast. <coughs> oh, great. <laughs> Somebody just rang my doorbell and my dog decided to chime in. Sorry about that. So anyways, you'll be blamed for poor performance and have to deal with it over several years if you have a, a slow database server. And new server hardware is actually very affordable compared to SQL Server licenses. Roxy! And you don't want to make the choice or the bad mistake of reusing old database hardware when you upgrade to a new version of SQL Server. That's a really foolish, false economy choice to make. And don't let your CTO or CIO push you into doing that if you have any choice in the matter. But you also need to be aware of the SQL Server hardware licensing limits and they're different for different versions and editions of SQL Server, and also they're different if you have virtualization versus not virtualized instances. So the SQL Server license limits that you need to worry about from a hardware perspective, if you're using Enterprise Edition, which hopefully everybody gets to use, but not everybody really does, you can use the operating system limits for total cores and sockets and RAM. And you want to use Windows Server 2016 if possible because that gives you higher limits for memory and also for number of processor cores that you can use in the OS and in SQL Server. Now SQL Server Standard Edition has lower limits for different SQL Server versions. So SQL Server 2012 can only use 64 gigs of memory for the buffer pool. And you're also stuck with four sockets or 16 physical cores, whichever is lower. Now, they raised this slightly for 2014 and 2016. So the memory limit went to 128 gigs for standard edition. And they raised it to 24 physical cores in standard edition with SQL Server 2016, which is better than it was. But I think all these limits are artificially low with modern hardware. And all these limits are per instance. And again, the socket and core limits are whichever is lower. And this also comes into play, and this bites a lot of people, with virtual machines because the socket limit comes into play especially. If you go in and create a virtual machine and you decide to set it up with, say, eight sockets, then it's only going to use four sockets because of that socket limit. And I've had a number of customers where that happened to them and they didn't even realize it. So it's something to be aware of. Now, SQL Server 2016 licensing costs, ever since SQL Server 2012, you have core-based licensing, and you have to have a minimum of four processor cores per socket. If you have less than that, they charge you for four. And so for standard edition, it's about $1,800 roughly per core license, and enterprise edition is about $7,100 per core license. And so if you've got really high core count processors, these licensing costs can add up really quickly, and that's why it's super important to pick the right processor to minimize your licensing costs. And Windows Server 2016 has a new licensing model, by the way, that you might not have heard of. It uses core-based licensing also. And it's interesting because it seems like the Windows Server team didn't really talk to the SQL Server team because they have different licensing models. But Windows Server 2016 requires a minimum of eight core licenses per processor or 16 core licenses for the Hey Glenn, your uh, sound cut off. Oh, you hear him? license costs by a lot. And you need to be aware that there's two main editions of Windows Server. There's Standard Edition and Data Center Edition. And for most SQL Server installations, you can get away with using Standard Edition. All you're really giving up is extra virtualization rights, plus you can't use Storage Spaces Direct on the machine where SQL Server itself is running unless you're using Data Center Edition. And so Standard Edition is actually not that expensive. 16 core licenses for Windows Server 2016 Standard Edition are only 882 dollars.
So you shouldn't let that be the tail that wags the dog and have a server administrator decide to buy a higher core count processor because of that, because the SQL Server license costs are much, much higher than the Windows Server license costs. So how do you go about evaluating and comparing different processors? There's so many different processors out there. Well, some general considerations is that single-threaded performance is really important, especially for OLTP workloads, because most of your OLTP queries are just going to run on a single processor core, whether it's a logical or physical core. And having really high single-threaded performance just makes the entire system run a lot faster. Now, having higher total core counts gives you more overall CPU capacity and scalability, so you can handle more concurrent queries and a higher workload. But doing that is going to drive up your SQL Server licensing costs really quickly. Another thing to think about is looking at how large the L2 and L3 especially cache sizes are on different processors is important because that's super important for database server performance. If you, if you can't find what you're looking for in the L1 cache, you've got to go to L2 and then L3 and then the main memory. And your latency goes up really quickly as you go further and further away from the processor. And so having a large L3 cache is super important. And that's one of the big differences you'll see with some of the different processor models. And processors themselves, at least for most of them, are relatively inexpensive. And you don't want to make a mistake that I see all the time where somebody goes and picks a lower end processor SKU at a given core count to save just a few hundred dollars per processor. And they might give up 20, 30, 40 percent of their single threaded performance and save far less than one percent of the system costs. And that's just not a good trade-off. But I see people doing that all the time. I mean, it makes sense on a laptop or a web server to maybe pick a low-end or mid-range processor SKU. But for SQL Server, with the really high license costs, you want to pick the very fastest processor you can get at a given core count. So this is something that Intel's been using for a number of years, and they're starting to move away from it. It's called the TikTok release strategy. And what this is, is every two years, what they used to do is they would release a new microarchitecture. So that's what you see in blue, and they all have code names like Nehalem and Sandy Bridge and Haswell, and that would be a talk. And then a year after that, they would take that same microarchitecture and shrink the manufacturing process and maybe make a few minor improvements, and that would be called a tick. And so you could look at this, and it would give you some guidance for what their future plans were, and you could also look at it going back in history to understand how old your current processors might be. So this is what it used to look like. And here's a newer slide. And the reason I show these slides is just so you can see the code words and the manufacturing process technology they are on. And where we're at right now with Intel servers is we're on Broadwell, the 14 nanometer Broadwell that came out about a year, year and a half ago. And we're getting ready to see the Skylake processors come out pretty soon. But Intel's actually had a problem recently because they're having a problem shrinking their manufacturing process technology from 14 nanometers to 10 nanometers. So they're moving away from the old TikTok model to this newer model called Process Architecture Optimization, PAO. And that means they stretch the process further and they introduce a new architecture on the same process and then they optimize that and they try to get three releases out of it on the same process instead of just two. And that's they're just running into problems as they get smaller and smaller and smaller. It's harder for them to release and get good yields on the new process manufacturing technology. So, you know, why you care about that is here's the schedule for the PAO release history and schedule. And so the new manufacturing process was 14 nanometers, and that's Broadwell. And that's where we're at right now in the server segment. And the way Intel does things is they release things in the mobile segment and the desktop segment first, and then they'll come out in the single socket server segment next, and then they come out for two socket servers, and then after a little bit of delay for four socket and larger servers. So we're on Broadwell right now, and then in the desktop, we've moved to Skylake and actually Cabby Lake, and that's where we're at for mobile and desktop. 
and that's the latest and greatest right now. But we're still stuck on Broadwell and the server segment. So here's sort of a family tree of Intel server processors going back nearly 10 years. And so this shows the Nehalem that came out way back in 2008. And that's when Intel moved from SMP to NUMA architectures on their processors. And that's when they really opened a big lead over AMD when it came to single-threaded performance. And really, ever since then, AMD has not been able to compete with Intel in the server segment. But there's actually some exciting news. AMD is on the verge of releasing a new server processor called Naples. And it's probably going to come out sometime in the next month or so. And it has much, much better single-threaded performance and much higher memory density and a lot more PCIe lanes. And it might actually give Intel some competition. So I'm looking forward to it. It's probably not going to be quite as fast on a single-threaded basis as Intel, but it's not going to be nearly as bad as the current AMD processors. So anyways, looking at this chart, you can see the model families and how they've changed over the years and how the process technology has shrunk over the years. And again, where we're at is that 2016 line, the third from the bottom, 14 nanometer Broadwell EP for two socket servers and Broadwell EX for four socket and bigger servers. And you can see the model numbers in that middle column. So this kind of lets you look back in time and see how old your processors are and how many generations you are behind the current release. So here's the current Intel server processor families. So for single socket servers and workstations, you have the Xeon E3, and they just came out with the V6 version of that, which is based on the Cabby Lake architecture, and that just came out a few weeks ago. And then the more interesting for most people is Xeon E5 V4, which is the 14 nanometer Broadwell EP. And what you want to use here is the E5 2600 series, the E5 4600 series doesn't perform very well. It doesn't really scale that well to four socket servers. But for two sockets, E5 is the very fastest you're going to get. And then if you need to go to a bigger server, a four socket or larger, then you jump up to Xeon E7, and that's on the V4, 14 nanometer Broadwell EX. And you actually want to prefer the E7-8800 series instead of the 4800 series, even though they're meant for eight socket systems, you can use them in four socket systems, and they actually have much higher clock speeds, but they are very expensive. So making that jump from two sockets to four sockets is really expensive, and you don't get double the capacity, by the way, too. So you're actually better off with two two-socket servers instead of one four-socket server if you can split your workload. So here's the current top-of-the-line Intel Broadwell EX, and that came out in the first quarter of 2016, so it's a little over a year old. And it has up to 22 cores, up to 55 megabytes of L3 cache, and it has PCIe 3.0 support, which is really important for storage performance. And it replaces the earlier Haswell EP. And one of the the main things they made to make uh, Broadwell better is better hardware virtualization support. And they also introduced hardware power management, so you get quicker clock speed increases controlled by the processor, especially if you're running Windows Server 2016 in conjunction with that. So it helps it throttle up more quickly. And I've got a link here that goes into a lot improvement with Broadwell is that they increased or they improved the virtualization hardware support. So it handles interrupts better and just performs better with virtualization. So little things like this are how you start to build the case for a hardware upgrade when you dig into all these details and find out the little performance benefits you get with no effort on your part. So this is a really important slide. These are the preferred Broadwell EP processors for SQL Server. And if you look at this chart, 
On the bottom, we've got a four core processor. So you see core slash L3. So you go four, six, eight, 10, and the core count increases. And if you were to look at the complete uh, SKU list for this family of processors, there's about, I don't know, 40 to 50 different models. And you'll find that there'll be three or four models that have 10 cores or eight cores. But you need to look really closely and pick one from this chart because these are the very fastest ones at that given core count. And Microsoft doesn't care whether you pick a slow core or a fast core, the license cost is exactly the same. Now, it might be a little bit more expensive to pick the, the top of the line one at a given core count, but that small additional hardware cost is a drop in the bucket compared to your license cost, especially as you have higher and higher core count processors. You'll also notice that as you go from four cores all the way to 22 cores at the top, the base clock speed goes down a lot. So you go from 3.5 gigahertz down to 2.4. And that's just a recent new processor model they introduced just a few months ago, the 2699A. It used to be the top of the line didn't have the A and it was only 2.2 gigahertz. And most of the time, your processor cores are going to be running at their base clock speed. They're not going to be running at turbo clock speed very often. So you might be looking, well, the turbo speeds are almost the same. That's true, but you're not going to be running at turbo speed that often on a database server. So the base clock speed is really important. Another thing to look at is when you look at the size of the L3 cache for the entire processor that's shared across all the cores, if you divide that by the number of physical cores, you can see how much uh, you get per core. And you get more per core at the bottom of this chart, typically, than you do at the top of the chart. So some of the ones like the E52667 and the E52643 do really well if you look at it that way. So those are kind of the little hot rod processors that run really fast and save you a huge amount of SQL Server license costs. So now we move on to the Intel Broadwell EX. And this is the big processor for four socket and larger servers. And these have up to 24 cores and up to 60 megabytes of L3 cache. But other than that, they're basically the same as the Broadwell EP. They have a few additional RAS features, reliability, availability, and I, I forget what the S stands for. But anyways, they're slightly better for a few things there, but they're much more expensive and they're not quite as fast as the Broadwell EPs. So here's that same chart for Broadwell EX. And again, you see four cores, and then it jumps to 10. There's a big hole here. They don't have really good choices for six or eight. So again, if you're going to get one of these, you want to choose from this chart rather than any other ones you might be thinking about. And again, I see this over and over and over with my customers where some server administrator who doesn't really know much about SQL Server just picked whatever processor they felt like for whatever reason they had in their mind and they make a bad choice and they give up a huge amount of performance and or spend a lot more money on their SQL Server license costs than they needed to. And what you might notice if you look at this chart versus the one a couple slides ago is that the base clock speeds for most of these are much, much lower than you saw with the E5s even though they're in the same family. So you're giving up quite a bit of performance Plus, as you go from two sockets to four to eight, you have more and more overhead from NUMA. And NUMA's much better than SMP used to be, but still, you know, you might just assume that, okay, a four socket server is going to have twice as much capacity as a two socket server, but that's just not true because of the NUMA overhead. So how do you decide on a particular processor? Well, one thing that I like to do, I do this a lot with our customers, is use actual TPCE benchmark scores. And there's, that's an OLTP benchmark with about, I don't know, about 77 results in there, and they're all for SQL Server. And it goes back about 10 years. So what you do is find the best actual score for a particular processor family, like Broadwell EP, for example. And what you'll find is that the server vendors, like HP or Fujitsu, they only make submissions for the flagship processor, the one with the highest core count, because that gives them the highest overall score for the benchmark. But you can go in 
and make some really easy with arithmetic adjustments for the core count and the base clock speed difference between the one that they submitted and the one you're looking at. So you go from a 22 core down to an 8 core and you look at the core count difference and the base clock speed difference and then you can calculate an estimated total score for a system with 8 cores and you can also divide that total score by the number of cores to get an idea of the single threaded performance of that processor. So the total score gives you the CPU capacity of the system and then the score per core tells you what the single threaded performance of that particular processor is. And going through this pretty simple exercise is really useful for sizing calculations for upgrades. So you've got an old four socket server that's four or five years old. You're trying to figure out, can you run your workload on a brand new two socket server? Or maybe you've got a bunch of old servers you're trying to consolidate onto one non-virtualized server, or maybe you're trying to come up with a virtualization host to run a bunch of VMs. So using these numbers is a good way, instead of just guessing, you have at least something to base your sizing calculations on. So here's an example of what I'm talking about. If I jump out of here, I've got a spreadsheet that you're not going to get a copy of, unfortunately, but I put a lot of effort into this where I've got all the processors in here and I've got all the different specs about them. And then I come up with my estimates. And this is, you know, all calculations based on the actual score right here. And all these other ones are based on that. And so I do that and then come up with a score per logical core and then a bunch of other stuff. And I've got these for pretty much every single Intel processor for the last 10 years. So instead of having to do this thing over and over and over again, I just pull up my magic spreadsheet and use that for these numbers. So that's where these numbers come from that you're going to see in some subsequent slides. And, and no, I'm not giving a copy of that out. So anyways, this is a chart. And you will get a copy of this. This shows you for these preferred processors that I just talked about what the raw TPCE score is for a system with that processor. That's the capacity of it. And then this is the score per core for that processor with two of them in a two socket system and you can see the ones at the bottom have lower core counts and they have much better single threaded performance but they also have less capacity so what you can do is kind of figure out where you want to be here and I also show you the SQL Server Enterprise Edition license cost for a single server with two of these processors so you can see you go from 57,000 to 313,000 if you go up here and really the main point of this talk is that a lot of server administrators who don't know any better might say, well, look, this is the best processor. I'm going to pick that. So they do that, and you have lots of capacity here, but you have a huge SQL Server licensing cost, and then your actual single thread performance is much lower than it would have been if you were further down this chart. So you want to try to find the sweet spot. And especially if you're on SQL Server Standard Edition, Microsoft only lets you use 24 physical cores and if you decide to pick one up here because you don't know any better, they only let you use 24 cores but they want you to pay this license cost and you can only use 24. So if your server administrator picked one up here because they didn't know any better and you're going to be running standard edition, you're going to have to pay all this extra money and only get to use 24 cores. That's a really expensive mistake and you're much better off being further down this chart. So here's the same. So if you can split your workload across multiple two-socket servers, that's what you want to do. All right. Another thing I wanted to talk about is that there's been generational performance improvements over time with these different generations of processors. So going back to about 2012, well, actually 2010, when the Sandy Bridge came out, here was the raw score for an eight-core processor for the entire system. 
And then here is the score per core. That's a single thread of performance. And then the next generation came out, and we had a little bit of a jump. And then the next generation and the next generation. So you can see that it's gotten better, but it's not as much better as you might hope. And really, if you've got a system that's this old or older, you might make a huge jump from where it is to the latest and greatest in terms of single thread of performance especially. And so what this means is a lot of times you can go from a four socket server down to a two socket server and have more capacity than your old system did and much, much better, sometimes three or four times better single threaded performance that's going to make your queries run faster assuming they don't have other bottlenecks like storage or memory. So here's the same chart for the E7 generation. And the reason why there's such a big jump here is that this is the Westmere EX, which was much, much older, and they skipped the Sandy Bridge in the E7 line. So these are all 10-core processors, and you can see what's happened with their single thread of performance and capacity. And you can also see that you're losing a lot of single thread of performance by using E7 instead of E5. All right. So another thing I want to point out, I'm not sure how many people have ever used or heard of a tool called CPU-Z, but this is a free tool that came out of the hardware overclocking community. So there's a lot of geeky people like me who build their own systems from parts, and then they'll go in and overclock them. And so this tool is developed as a way to document how fast you could overclock your system. And you might say, well, I don't care about that. I'm a DBA. You know, I don't build parts, computers out of parts, but where this is useful for us DBAs is this shows you all the gory details about your processor, and then it shows you right here the core speed, the current core speed of core zero of processor number one, and if you've got a multi-socket system, you can pick different processors here. And why this is so important is that when you install Windows Server 2008 or newer, by default, it uses the balanced power plan in Windows, and that will throttle back the clock speed on the system to save electricity. And then what happens is when you see a load on the system, it throttles up. But the problem is, depending on exactly what processor we're talking about, that takes anywhere from 100 to 200 milliseconds for it to throttle up. And many OLTP queries in SQL Server are done in far less than 100 to 200 milliseconds. So it's running at a lower clock speed, and then it gets a burst of queries, and it tries to throttle up, and it can't do it quickly enough. So you lose a decent amount of performance. So the very first thing you should do after you watch this session is check your production servers and make sure they're all using the high-performance power plan. And you can just click it, and it takes effect immediately. The only problem is sometimes after you, even after you do that, you'll still see the core speed running much lower than the base clock speed. And if that's the case, that means you've got some other form of power management in effect, whether it's at the hypervisor level with VMs or in the BIOS with a non-virtualized instance. And even with VMs, you know, the BIOS is going to override, override what the hypervisor wants to do. So anyways, the point of this tool is once you've got everything set correctly, you want to see your clock speed running at at least your base clock speed. And then you occasionally want to see it go higher as it goes up to turbo speed as it sees a little bit of a load. So this tool is the best way I know of to confirm what's going on with your power management. And another thing I want to point out is you can go to this bench tab. And this is something they added about a year ago, and they keep improving it. It's a real quick and dirty CPU benchmark. And when you click on this, it goes through and does a single-threaded benchmark for about 5 to 10 seconds, and then it switches to a multi-threaded benchmark that hits all of your processors for about 5 or 10 seconds. And you can run this to compare like an old server to a newer server, or you can use it, you can run it on your laptop or your desktop and compare it to your production database server and use that to try to convince your organization that your database server sucks because it's so, so slow. And there's an online, you can submit these scores and look them on, up online and compare across different systems. So this is a real quick and dirty CPU benchmark that's super easy to run. So I really kind of like that. So let me show you something else here, back on the PowerPoints here. <clears throat> 
So here's an example. You know, let's say that your server admin, his name is Sean, and he goes out without talking to you and buys a new database server. And it's a two socket server, so he made a good choice there, but he went out and he wanted to save some money for the company. So he goes out and gets a two socket server with two Xeon E5 2609 V4 processors. These are eight core processors and they're very inexpensive. But it turns out that that's a terrible, terrible choice because this thing has a really low clock speed. It doesn't have hyper threading. I don't think it has turbo boost. And so even with two of these eight core uh, processors, my estimate for the TPCE score for that system is only 693 for the entire system. And you've got 16 processor core licenses you have to pay for SQL Server. So that's $114,000 for your SQL Server licenses and you only get this much capacity. And then your single threaded performance is really, really bad because you take this and divide it by 16 to get this number. Now a much better choice would be to get one six core Xeon E5 2643 V4. And this one six core processor is so much faster and it has hyper threading and turbo boost. It's going to come in this way for the total score. So it has about 75% more capacity and it has over four times better single threaded performance. So that sounds good. But then look here, I'm only paying $42,000 for my SQL Server licenses. So I'm saving about $70,000. Maybe you should give that to me as a bonus. But seriously, you're going to have more capacity, much better performance, and the money you saved here more than paid for this server and even some really good uh, flash storage on top of that. And so this is an example of a very bad choice versus a much better choice. And you need to think like this when you're looking at servers. All right, another thing I want to talk about is there's a data retrieval hierarchy in a server. And so you go from the L1 cache, which is really small and has really low latency, to the level 2 cache, which is larger but has double the latency. And this is on a modern Intel processor, by the way. And then you go out to the level 3 cache, which is a lot bigger, but that's shared across all the cores. And the latency doubles again. And then you have to go out to main memory. And you can have to, up to 24 terabytes with Windows Server 2016, but your latency goes up even more. And now we have some new layers that you might not be aware of. There's a thing called persistent memory, where you can get these non-volatile DIMMs that fit in your regular memory slots, and they use uh, flash memory, well, these are a certain kind of non-volatile memory that has a battery or capacitor backup, actually. And without any application changes, they use block mode, and they have this much latency, 6.5 microseconds. And if you go through and jump some hoops and format it with DAX mode, it bypasses the storage stack and gets 800 nanoseconds latency. And these can be used for tail the log caching with SQL Server 2016, where you have a second log file that just caches the very tail of the log, and it's super fast. So if you have a bottleneck where writing to your log file, even on the very fastest flash storage you can find, is your bottleneck, this can help you a lot. And these are... So that's why these, more, these new layers are coming into play in between storage and main memory. All right, so now we're on the topic of memory. Just some general things to think about memory. Memory is much, much faster than any of those other storage layers you saw on that chart. Much lower latency and much higher bandwidth and throughput. And so don't skimp on your memory. It really bothers me when 
I see a production server with like 16 gigs or 32 gigs of RAM and it's under memory pressure. Memory is very inexpensive, especially compared to SQL Server licenses. And having a large SQL Server buffer pool reduces the number of physical reads coming from your storage system. You're doing logical reads instead of physical reads when it's in the buffer pool. And it just reduces the read load on your entire storage subsystem. And it also helps even out the right workload because it's not having to flush things out to free up memory in the buffer pool. And it's pretty feasible now, even with two socket servers, to have your entire workload fit in the buffer pool. And you can go up 24 terabytes with Windows Server 2016. And modern two socket servers can have one and a half terabytes, and that's going to go up when these new AMD servers come out. And RAM is pretty inexpensive. And if you're going to be using in-memory OLTP, you can use the entire OS RAM limit for in-memory OLTP, which is a big improvement in SQL Server 2016. And another thing to think about is memory performance considerations. If you have a smaller workload, you don't need to put sockets and memory in every socket of the server. Well, the very best thing you can do to get the best memory performance possible is just put one DIMM per memory channel. And your memory controller is in your processor with modern Intel processors. And so having one DIMM per channel gives you the highest memory bandwidth. So 2400 megatransfers per second versus 1866 megatransfers per second, depending on how you configure your memory. And so that means if you're trying to do this, that means you only put eight DIMMs in a two socket Intel server right now. And that'll give you the very best memory bandwidth. And that's if your working set fits in the buffer pool when you only have that much memory. And I wouldn't use this as a reason to skimp on memory because if you do this and it doesn't fit in the buffer pool, then you're having to go off of the storage subsystem. And that's going to be a lot slower than even, quote, slower memory because of having all the dim sockets populated and having reduced memory bandwidth. So the, I guess the point of this is that all the server vendors like HPE and Dell have very detailed guidance for different server models and different processors on how to configure your memory to get the best performance for a given amount of memory. And just be aware that one DIMM per channel is a very fast as you can do, but if you need more, don't be afraid to do that because even slower memory is faster than any kind of storage. All right, finally, there's some key BIOS settings you want to think about and make sure have been set up correctly. So the first one is Turbo Boost. That's what lets you go from your base clock speed to the Turbo Boost clock speed on individual cores. And usually that's enabled, but somebody might have gone in and disabled it because they were worried about it reducing the life of the processor or overheating the system. And that's really not a, a valid consideration. These should be turned on. And AMD has a similar thing. It's called Turbo Core, and they should be turned on. Hyper-threading is a little bit more controversial. Most of the time it should be enabled, especially for OLTP workloads. It gives you a little bit more capacity, but it doesn't double your capacity. It's more like 20 to 30% more capacity. It doesn't help performance at all. It just gives you more capacity. And the only reason you might want to disable hyper-threading is some data warehouse and pure reporting workloads. Occasionally, some queries can be slower with hyper-threading, but you should test it. And, and if you don't want to test it or can't, I would just enable hyper-threading by default. Uh, the other thing that's super important, in my opinion, is processor power management. It should be set to OS control in the BIOS because whatever's going on in the BIOS will override your Windows power plan, like I talked about earlier. And you can use CPU-Z to see what's really going on after all the different levels of power management come into play. And then finally, if you're going to be doing virtualization, make sure that hardware virtualization is enabled in the BIOS. So that's going to enable VTX and VTD support, which helps your virtualization performance a lot. So there I am. I'm done maybe a minute or two early, but I've got some time for questions here. If there are any. Oh uh, yeah, we have a few questions, Glenn. Okay. Um, there's a question about running CPU Z in production. Okay. 
Well, yeah, that comes up fairly often. I've been doing it for years, and maybe I've just been lucky, but it's never caused a problem. You don't have to install it. It's just an executable that you run. But if you're nervous about it, then do it during a maintenance window or do it before you put the server in production. But, you know, I do it all the time. It's very useful, but if you don't want to do it, don't. You know, you're just you're losing the easy ability to see what your clock speed is in real time. And I know it shows up in Task Manager in Windows, on modern versions of Windows, but you can't always believe what Task Manager says. I believe CPU Z more than Task Manager, but if you don't really don't want to do it, this will give you some insight to your current clock speed. Another question we have is, um, do you have a checklist of the hardware for recommendations? Well, not really. I mean, people come to SQL Skills fairly often and ask for consulting help along that line. And, and what I generally do as part of that kind of an engagement is I have a few queries I'll run on their old system to see what hardware they have and how it's performing and whether there's anything markedly wrong with their old system that's making it run more poorly than you would expect. So I look at that and then I use that to come up with recommendations for new hardware, you know, and it depends on their budget and some other things, but that's kind of what I go about. And, and I seriously use those calculations I was talking about to help come up with sizing recommendations. Okay, thank you. Um, wow, getting a lot of questions. How, I'm sure, how two sockets is better than four socket machine and what, it, so there are questions about like when you were displaying two versus four sockets and the overhead for NUMA. Yeah, well, the problem is when you're dealing with a single socket system, everything is in the same memory pool. It's on the same NUMA node and you're not making any foreign memory accesses. But even when you go to two sockets, you start to have a little bit of NUMA overhead because occasionally what you're looking for is not in your local NUMA node and you've got to go to the other one. And it just gets worse as you go to four sockets and eight sockets. And if you actually look at some of the benchmark submissions, sometimes there's been a few examples where they took the exact same processor in a two socket system and a four socket system or in a four and an eight. And you would expect the performance to be pretty linear and the scalability to be pretty linear, but it's not because of that extra NUMA overhead. And so that's why, and, and plus on top of that, if you look at the, the processors that are available for two socket systems versus four socket systems, they become available earlier for two socket systems, and they're just faster. The clock speeds are faster. And so that's why if I have any choice and if I can split my workload if I need to across multiple systems, I'm always going to prefer two socket over four socket systems. Okay. Here's a question about CPU-Z. Um, it says only shows core zero. They have a, uh, I guess, a two core laptop, but it doesn't show the other cores. Hmm. I'm not well, sure. Well, I mean, yeah. What they might be meaning is I've got, you know, my desktop only has one processor, so that's why this is grayed out. Oh, okay. And you can't switch it to anything, because all you can do is pick one processor or another. You can't pick one core or another. Although, actually, I think there's a command line that you can run this with to let you pick a different core. Any other questions? Uh, are you still there? I'm double muted. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Rob has lost his audio. Okay. Uh, have you ever worked with SQL Server on overclock CPUs? You get a higher clock speed but lose hyper-threading. Uh, 
stability well, might be a concern. Well, I mean, on on typical servers from vendors like Dell and HPE, they don't let you overclock. But where you see overclocking is if you've got you know a motherboard from Taiwan that you build a system with from parts, you have the ability to overclock that. But usually, people aren't going to use that in production. And just because you overclock doesn't mean you necessarily lose hyperthreading. What some people will do when they're trying to do extreme overclocks, because there's actually competitions and people use liquid nitrogen and get all crazy, they'll disable hyperthreading on purpose to get a better overclock. But none of that really has anything to do with SQL Server, especially in a production setting. All right. Uh, next, do you recommend using soft NUMA in SQL Server 2016? Well, what Microsoft does by default is if you have more than eight cores in a NUMA node, they'll turn on auto soft NUMA and divide it into soft NUMA nodes. And according to their research and testing, you typically get better performance if you do that. I haven't seen enough systems in production on 2016 yet to really have an opinion on that. You know, my guidance would be to go ahead and use Microsoft's default recommendation, but if you're really worried about it, and can do some testing, you know, I would try it both ways. But I think Microsoft has a good reason for doing that. They've just seen that as the core count gets higher, they start to have some performance issues and they found that soft NUMA helps. But it depends on your workload. All right, here's an interesting one. Do you have any hardware recommendations and license recommendations for SQL Server 2016 on Linux? Well, SQL Server 2016 does not run on Linux. SQL Server vNext, which will probably be called 2017, by the way, will run on Linux. But other than that, you know, as far as I'm concerned, the hardware recommendations are going to be pretty similar. I mean, you're going to get better single-thread performance with lower core counts and picking a particular processor, and Linux shouldn't change that equation. It's, you know, it's more of a hardware thing. And it remains to be seen whether the different uh, distributions of Linux will perform better or worse than Windows. We'll see. But, yeah, I don't think it's going to change the hardware recommendations. I think we've hit all the questions. Uh, Rob, have you made it back in yet? Yeah, I'm back. Uh, thank you, Kenny. Uh, I lost my audio and I uh, couldn't hear for a bit, but I'm back. So uh, just general statements. Uh, we're gonna, the session is recorded, and we're going to put it on YouTube, and we'll put the downloads on our data architecture chapter. And I just want to uh, thank everyone for coming today, especially Glenn for giving the presentation, and Kenny for helping me out when I lost my audio. So um, I hope everyone yeah. has. Yeah, thanks, guys, for hosting this. And, again, if you guys have any other questions that didn't come up, send me an email, glenn at sqlskills.com. Okay, well, I uh, hope everyone has a great uh, afternoon, and we're going to stop it here. Thank you all. All right, thanks.